You're listening to the Rethreading Madness podcast, which airs live on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. We are recorded and produced on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Slayway Tooth Nations around Vancouver, B.C. I'm your host, Bernadine Fox, and this is the show that dares to change how we think about mental health. Welcome to our show. I've never been further knowing what the hell I'm going to do when I can't seem to find my way under or over or through just when I'm ready. And today I have the pleasure of chatting with my good friend, David Roach, who is, uh, well, let's just say you're a very unique individual. We could say that. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) You like that, did you? Um, So David, let's talk about who you are. So everybody knows um, you are somebody who has uh, spoken at the White House. You've uh, headlined at the Olympics Arts Festival in Australia. You're a keynote speaker. You're an author of a book. Um, You've done uh, work with your wife, Malena, who is, uh, I should say, Malena Blavin, who has worked with you on uh, video and uh, for teenagers in schools. And most recently, you've been granted the Order of Canada. So let's, why did all that happen? Who are you? Oh. Oh. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I just got the Order of Canada. And over the last uh, two, three weeks, I've been inundated with wonderful congratulations and mm. approvals and cheers and uh, remembrances, uh, and it's giving me a sense of who I am in a new mm-hmm. way. I feel like all along, the various things that I've done, that I've been part of disability arts and part of other things, a pioneer in many ways, I mm-hmm. always felt I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know why. I did what I did, but I'm hearing from people a validation over the last 33 years as a performer that I have a a very powerful presence Mm -hmm. because people remember me not only from being on stage or in films, but from meeting me on the bus. Yes. In the checkout line. Yes. Um, so there's something that I have that I don't know what it is. I'm a nice guy. I'm you a are nice a nice guy. guy. Um, and, and that kind of counterpoints my facial difference. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a whole theory about that anyway. So let's just, before we go farther, um, what the Order of Canada said that you, you received this because of your pioneering contributions to the field of disability art and for promoting acceptance and inclusion and diversity across Canada and the United States. And that kind of goes to what you're talking about. You are a nice guy, and, but you do have a presence. And it, your presence is much more than you, what facial difference you, you live with. Um, it's about your heart and how you approach people and how you how you approach life. And it is um, really, what's the word? It's awe-inspiring, David. That's what it is. It's awe-inspiring. So let's get some words down. Um, there's different words. We, there, people use disfigurement, facial difference, visible difference. Which, which do you use? I think I heard you say facial difference, but is that your preference? Um. That's kind of the generic term. Uh, sometimes I say facially disfigured when I want to be more clear. Okay. Um, but uh, if the fallback is facial difference. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, face, when, when we talk about faces, they are, we grow up with our face, we 
we hate our face. We have all kinds of relationships to our faces. We try and make our faces other things. Our face is very much a part of our identity and our sense of self. Um, but you, your face is a little different. So tell me um, what, what caused your facial differences? Uh, well, I started out in the womb with a facial difference. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, some genetic difference uh, that uh, appeared initially as swollen veins on my left eyelid at birth, and the doctor said, well, they're going to go away in a few days, and it's been many thousand days, and they haven't gone away. Right. It's gotten larger, so that the left side of my face is kind of bulging with veins, gone wild mm -hmm. um, and then that's in my mouth and on the side of my head my throat etc a little bit on the right side as it's grown over the decades and then at age one at the Mayo Clinic in the U.S. I had my lower lip removed which was beginning to swell and as my father said it looked like a bunch of small concord grapes. Oh. So they cut that off. And then they uh, irradiated me. This is 1945. 1945, wow. Radiation was a miracle cure. And they, right. they, it was everywhere. They, they irradiated kids with tonsillitis. Oh, my God. Anyhow, that they did not really know what they were doing. No. They did not know how to target it. They did not know how to measure it. So the whole lower part of my face uh, stopped growing. And uh, the left side of my skull, if you palpate it, it feels like Swiss cheese. Oh. Um, so uh, it's like a strange and wonderful face <laughs> that I have. Well, describe your face then for This Is Radio. Um, people can't actually see what what you're describing can can you describe your face on the left side of my face you'll see mottled veins of actually very lovely colors of red violet and blue violet and a mm. dark purple mm -hmm. uh, and they bulge out and my chin is small and kind of receding my mm -hmm. tongue is dark purple mm. uh, and i do not have a lower lip but i have sort of a not an artificial wit. Uh, and uh, then on my left temple, uh, the uh, concavity where they removed what they said was a two cancerous lesion when I was 10 years old. And, uh, and I have dentures, which actually are very nice dentures. You have dentures. Did, did this affect your teeth then? Yeah, the radiation. Uh -huh affected my teeth and uh, they, they did not grow so well. So uh, there's a myriad of, uh, of things going on on my face. It looks like God was a tattoo artist. <laughs> yes, and he had a strange idea about art. Yeah. Yeah. So you grew up in the States then? I was born uh, just outside Chicago. My dad uh, was born in Nova Scotia, so I am a Canadian citizen since right. 1947, I guess, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and dual citizenship, yeah. Now, I'm in on the Sunshine Coast of uh, D.C. Right. Uh, since 2003, so I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, yeah we like having you here. Yeah, it's, it feels better. The world on this side of the continent feels better knowing that you're up there. Um, yeah. So so you grew up in Chicago then or did you grow up in Canada? I grew up just outside Chicago. Just outside Chicago. OK. Yeah, in that area around Gary, Indiana, industrial, probably the most polluted place on the planet at that time. Well, uh, and then later on, I saw the hippie trail out to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I got into Canada. And as a child, I know this may be a painful question, but it's one that 
you know, people, I, I feel people want to understand these things. As a child, were you bullied or did you have people around you who were more progressive and understanding or what happened? I mean, 1945 is not at a time when people were understanding these things. <laughs> Although mm -hmm. uh, it uh, became a post-war period and that was a time when actually uh, people with disabilities were seen and in some ways honored, especially when they were veterans. So that was a step forward for, for oh, yes. those rights in some ways. But no, I actually, uh, I was not bullied. I'm the oldest of seven children and nobody ever talked about my face at home. When I started in school, I asked uh, uh, my mother, you know, people were asking about me and what should I tell them? And she said, oh, just tell them it's a birthmark. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I did. Then when I went to school, I was in a Catholic school. Mm. And uh, I got uh, the, you know, kind of the sweeter side of Catholicism, uh, where the nuns would uh, tell us, uh, you are a soul. Mm -hmm. and you are a child of God. And, and that uh, sunk into me. And uh, every once in, I, so I had school. I had the same school for eight years. I had the same neighborhood, uh, that kind of thing. And I benefited from that. And it was total denial. Total denial. Well, it yeah. sounds like really your. Do you think your family was in denial? It doesn't sound like your mom was in denial. Not in denial. It, I, it put me in denial, which oh. was great in certain ways. I I never thought of myself as being different and disfigured. I played ball. Mm -hmm. You know, I was the smartest kid in the class. Right. I did all those kind of good things. Uh, we're talking to adolescents here, of course. Right. Uh, and uh, and and so uh, I, I was treated treated well. Uh, I wrote the talk in schools nowadays, and kids talk a lot more about being bullied. Yes, I, I just think I benefited from that. And I grew up and I was born in 1944. Mm -hmm. My father was in a German prisoner of war camp. Mm. My mother did not know whether he was going to come back. Wow. Uh, and I was born into a family that was my mother, her two sisters were teenagers, and uh, my grandmother, Nana, and grandfather, and Blackie the dog. It was a matriarchy, mm -hmm. and I was so loved. Yes, I you were. All the time with the fear and desolation, and here comes little David. Yeah. So I benefited from that. I know I did. I mean, I don't remember it, but it sounds like you had a lovely childhood. I actually had a lovely childhood. Yeah, yeah. I I envy you. That's wonderful. Yeah. So so as you grew as a teenager and stuff, did the bullying ever start, or did you literally manage to escape all of the stuff that most kids deal with these days when they're different? Well, I managed to escape it for a, a rather different reason. First of all, I, I thought I'm the oldest child in an Irish Catholic family. Here's the kids, David, Craig, Kathleen, Patrick, Kevin, Michael, Teresa, Irish Catholic, right? Um, and I was the oldest. I was a good boy. I was an altar boy. I was really smart, mm -hmm. well-behaved. You should be a priest, David. My <laughs> aunt Rose leaned over my cradle, as a legend goes. Mm. That this boy is destined to be a bishop. Ah. Well, thank God that did not come true. I went to uh, the, uh, the interview at a seminary, Holy Cross Seminary at Notre Dame University. Mm -hmm. I told them I loved Jesus and I wanted to be a priest. And these two priests told me, uh, you're too ugly to be <gasps> a priest. Oh, my God. I never, ex that, that's shocking to me. I did not expect that. Well, nor did I. I because the nuns and the, what I had grown up coddled spiritually and, and that and in denial, but 
uh, here I am, 13 years old. Right. And, uh, when the priest talks, the priest is transmitting the word of God. Yes. That was the belief. And here's me. I'm hearing God telling me that I'm a monster. Oh. Um, so that, that actually was the worst thing that ever happened to me regarding my facial difference. Um, it just came out of nowhere. That would uh, be a betrayal on so many levels for you since you were born and raised in the church. A total betrayal, a total yeah. shock. And yet, as I look at it today, I say, thank God. Mm. Because? Oh. Because I got to live the life that I've lived. Yeah. I think given what was happening in the Catholic Church at that time, that would have been deadly. Mm -hmm. I did end up in a different seminary uh, for four years. Then they kicked me out because they said I was the worst influence they ever had <laughs> due to a sense of humor, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so the, in the seminary, all male, avoiding... Uh, uh, interaction, you know, taking on that Catholic point of view, women mm -hmm. are, well, you're either a Madonna or a whore. I'm you sorry, so women are what? Or oh, the Madonna or the whore? Yeah, that's wow. the... That's, that's true. That's the two choices, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so then I end all this while, then I start, I have alcohol, and that, mm -hmm. that alcohol and denial. <laughs> I'm Bernadine Fox, and I'm sitting down, well, virtually sitting down, talking with David Roach, which if you were listening to the last segment, know that he is this incredible powerhouse that uh, just recently was awarded the Order of Canada. And we were talking about his childhood, and I just want to continue on with that a little bit more. Um, most kids... Well, first off, I just want to say that the idea of you following the hippie trail is a, an, an amazing image in my mind. I hope you have pictures from then, do you? Because I have one picture. One uh, picture. Well, I'd love to see it, David. Um, yeah, I don't think so. No? Yeah. Oh, okay. That's okay. But maybe in private sometimes. Okay. All right. That's fine. Um, so... I did a little reading. I don't do too much reading for these things because I like to learn along with my audience uh, about things. Um, but I did find that facial differences um, can cause higher rates of um, PTSD, body image issues, having to deal with stigma. They can lower the quality of people's lives, lower their satisfaction of their life and um, create problems in their marriage and social and work life. It doesn't sound like you've had to deal with that, which I'm, which I'm really grateful for, for you. Um, but I do know that kids these days in schools do deal with that. Um, how did you, how did you move past this? You talked about alcohol at one point. Um, somehow I retained a core of self-confidence. I think it was fueled by a sense of uh, responsibility. And now that comes partially from being Catholic and then being in a seminary, partially from being the oldest of seven kids. And that's my natural bent. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I, I did good things. I helped start childcare centers. Mom. Uh, uh, was one of the co-founders of the Child Care Switchboard and Single Parent Resource Center of San Francisco. And there uh, we started out as hippies. We thought mm. we were going to teach the mothers of San Francisco how to have cooperative child care. But when we started answering the phones, we found out the truth about the lives of single mothers they didn't want cooperative child care. They wanted child care. They mm -hmm. wanted a job. They yeah. wanted support. Yeah. And they did not get what they needed. No. Uh, so that affected me. Anyhow, I, I did. Why did I do that? I, I, why did I participate in that? I, that's what, I don't know. I just did. The best that I can understand it 
at this point is that I was always visceral, always and coming from the heart. My feelings, I, I, I live in my body a lot. I still do. I'm, I dance, I do yoga. I'm quite physically healthy, amazingly so. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so anyway, I think that it was, I did things because I cared and I wanted to be responsible. I mean, when you think of it, I worked at the child care switchboard for eight years and I'm picking up the phone every day and I'm listening to the truth of single parenthood, which mm -hmm. is the 8% single motherhood. And then women walk into our office and uh, they have black eyes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what happened? Oh, I'm, I'm leaving him. It's over. Oh, well, well, let's see what we can do. Uh, two months later, back again, mm -hmm. I'm in a swim. What the heck? Come on. What's going on? So what I'm doing here is I'm learning about the patriarchy. Okay? Right. right. I'm learning about what women have to deal with. Oh, and, okay, so there I am, Dina. I'm a good boy. You know, that's my first feeling about getting the uh, Board of Canada Award. Mm. I thought, oh, yay, I've been a good boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going back to Catholicism, of course. Well, and also, um, I would, I would venture to say you probably you correct me if I'm wrong, but you lived with women and you know, women who loved you, and you would have felt in your core that you were a good boy. You know, you would have had a core of self confidence that came right from the moment you were born. Really, I think that that's very true, and thank you for saying it. I felt lucky that way. Mm -hmm. You know, and I also had other, what I also, mm, okay, well, why not say it? In eighth grade, I was tested on the Stanford Diné IQ test and came out as having an IQ of 170. Oh my gosh. Oh my brilliant. Gosh. Brilliant. So yes. I, only, and it wasn't me, Terry. What actually happened is I got pushed into this intellectual life. Uh, well, you should be at least a lawyer. Well, now that you're not going to be a priest. And anyhow, there was that image that I was so intelligent, and I am very intelligent, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, I did fine on things. Like uh, in 1966, I was out of college and looking for a job, and I ha had no focus. I did what I thought I was supposed to do. I was trying to be a good boy. Mm -hmm. But then they did not have computer education for programmers or anything mm -hmm. like that. I uh, took a programmer's attitude test and I got 100%. Wow. I hated computers. <laughs> but my first job, I earned more money than my father as a municipal wife. Yeah. So what is the motivation in that? What, yeah. what, I don't know. It's... And my life is a puzzle, but I, I do think that I most always was following my heart, even mm. under the influence of alcohol, which I continued drinking until I was in my 40s. Right. But meanwhile, leading a good life. Uh, amazing. It does sound like that. I mean, and and as much as you were doing that sort of in a in a way that had a label to it, i.e., as helpline or help situations for single parents, you're still doing that. That's what you're doing these days. So you, your your life path has been on a trajectory that really never went off course. Even though you changed it a lot, you're still doing work that is um, helping other people. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I just can't help it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I do. and, and, and another part of that thing is how I have always, and even in you know the times of denial and alcoholism, I always survived and tried with friends. Mm -hmm. Look at it: a family of seven children, the seminary, many other boys, all male Catholic school. Right. You know, hippies, communes, uh, on and on, uh, always with other people. 
right uh, and and with friends with dear people and there's the heart again you know I'm just right. reaching out people reaching to me that's how i live i don't understand the the, the uh, social media and stuff like that how people can go without flesh what do you mean go without fresh flesh oh flesh yes Hmm. (laughs) Uh, social media is all about the selfie and the their life and putting it out there and um you know, it's, it's, it's taken me a long time to get it as well. I'm in my sixties now. And so it's, it really is a medium for younger people. They get it. They understand it. I'm, I struggle with it myself personally. I feel it's a a necessary thing to do because it is how people learn about things you're doing, but it is something I still struggle with. Um, you, um, let me just check the time here and see where we're going. Um, what so how long did you work in this organization you said for eight years when did you start moving towards being a humorist i think you call it well there's another period uh at the working in the uh, single parent resource center led me to become involved politically which was initially with the mayor's committee on child care in san mm-hmm. francisco but that was filled with people who just wanted to benefit from it themselves. Hmm. Uh, that led me to becoming an, uh, a Marxist, a Marxist-Leninist, an actual communist, which I did for 12 years. That was how I thought that I could change, the help to change the world. Right. It was an organization founded by 10 women. So I thought, well, that must be good. Well, it doesn't always work that way. <laughs> it didn't um, work out, hey? Didn't work out. No. <laughs> didn't work out. Um, and uh, I came out of that. I became a massage therapist. I thought I wanted to be a nurse until I found out what it is that nurses actually <laughs> do. Um, yes. Then, uh, yeah, then, yeah, then what? Then here I am. Then I, I what happened was, in that spiritual and physical devastation after the communist organization that I was in fell apart, I was never a true believer. I was a true doer. Mm. Um, but I ended up, I weighed 115 pounds and I'm oh. little. I'm wow. nobody should be that little. I was drinking heavily. I was smoking a couple types of cigarettes. I was smoking dope and I was eating crap. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had to work my way through that. Hmm. And I did. So, <clears throat> so let me ask you something. Having an IQ of 170, do you think that sometimes alcohol, I mean, I think it's sometimes painful to be that smart in this world sometimes. You know, you, you see things and you understand things that other people, it goes right over their heads. Do you think the alcohol and all of that is a part of numbing that a bit so that it's not so difficult to live in our world that is full of really horrible things? I I think that that was certainly part of it, Bernie. I, mm. uh, you know, at that stage, I wasn't thinking about it. I was just drinking. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that, 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 that helped. And I, you know, in a world of disability and facial difference, uh, you, okay, I shouldn't, I, I think I have read that there is a higher susceptibility for dealing with life through alcohol and drugs. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes that can be brought on by prescribed medications. Anyhow, it happens. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. I, got, I, I came through that. And then uh, I, I quit drinking and then... Uh, in a period of seven months, I quit alcohol, marijuana, coffee, and cigarettes. Wow. Although I'm back on coffee now, to be honest. Wow. Well, I mean, yeah. who wouldn't drink coffee? I mean, it's just, <laughs> I know there's lots of people out there that says coffee is really bad for you, but I don't understand. I've drank coffee since I was 23. That's about 40 years now. Mm-hmm. And um, I have never, ever even imagined quitting 
coffee. I, I don't see it as having any, any negative side for me. Um, and given that I live with chronic fatigue, you know, staying awake is paramount <laughs> to my life. So coffee yeah. remains something that is a necessary thing, but I don't see any downside. Do you, did you have, did you find a positive part of not drinking coffee? Did it come with? I was just trying to clean myself up. And then, oh. uh, then uh, in the next year, I went to the massage school. And there I met Marlena, mm. uh, as we both volunteered, which is another pioneer thing, at uh, a hostel in San Francisco that uh, became, we were two of the founders of the first massage therapy program in a hostel in the United States. Great. That also became uh, a national model, um, mm. and that was wonderful. And yes. my Marlena was great. So I was clean and sober, and I had love. Yes, Woo-hoo! yes, and oh, I, oh. yeah, I know <laughs> it's wonderful. I love the way you and Marlena love each other. It's it's makes me feel believe in love. That's what it does. It makes me believe in love. And we're going to take a little break. And uh, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about um, some more of the stuff about which fuels the work that you do um, these days, which is important work. So don't go away, folks. We'll be right back. Hey, this is Bernadine Fox, your host for Rethreading Madness, the show that dares to change how we think about mental health. If you're enjoying this podcast, don't miss out on the next episode. Make sure you subscribe. I'm Bernadine Fox, and I am chatting with David Roach, most recent uh, recipient of the Order of Canada for his work around disability arts. And more particularly, David, let's get into the heart of what you do and why you do it. The most, the thing that you said once upon a time, which I don't know why it never occurred to me, because it should have occurred to me, is that people who have body disfigurements or facial differences are often um, cast in our popular culture as the monster. Um, so I, I'm, it, it was an important thing for me to get. It was, I don't understand why I never understood it before, or didn't see it before. And it's part of those things. It's like racism. It becomes normalized to the point where you think it's right. And um, so I want you to talk about that. And how did you get on to doing this? How did you what I can imagine what fueled you to do it, but how did it start? Uh, I was in a relationship with Marlena mm-hmm. when we first met, and we were having an affair. Mm-hmm. And that was ending the affair, Tyler, that was changing into a relationship. And, uh, well, here's the truth of the matter. Marlena said, honey, we should have a monogamous relationship. And I said, wait a minute, (laughs) you're married. What do you mean monogamous? Mm -hmm. She said, well, uh, we don't have sex anymore. And I said, you don't have sex anymore? Well, hardly ever. Hardly ever? (laughs) Well, I don't like it. Anyhow, I felt like, okay. And so I agreed to that. And it turned out to be a good decision. But I also felt, okay, I need to take care of myself. I'm putting all my energy into this relationship. And uh, I had been in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, there, uh, a friend of mine started classes in the, the humor of recovery. And he said, don't tell jokes. Just tell the truth about your life. Right. That's what's funny. And so I started doing that. Um, and, and, it, and it turned out well. And I started making little bits of money. And then I started building on it. I started out, I thought I was a comedian. I told jokes about my face. Mm-hmm. I hated that. Mm. Hated it. But once I uh, started being more human, um, people liked it. Here's, mm-hmm. here's my secret. I go on stage and I look 
definitely a decision, very unusual. And there's that kind of silence in the room, uh, you know, a couple hundred people in the audience, and I say, okay, when I count to three and point to you, I want everyone here to say, what happened to your face? Mm -hmm. I remember and, that. I've been in that audience. And I do, and they say it, and they love it. And right away, I've established a relationship, and I'm a shaped shifter. Mm. I go from being disfigured, takes me about 10 to 12 minutes, and all of a sudden, I'm this incredibly attractive person out there. Mm. It's and true. You know, what I, you know what I've done? I've, I've, done, I've done like a, a, a lesson for them. Mm -hmm. I've learned everybody feels disfigured. Everybody has some little place inside themselves where they feel guilty, ashamed, body shamed, stilted, fat, ugly, uh, dyslexic, whatever kind of thing, in addition to uh, uh, racial and uh, in indigenous prejudices and, of course, the old favorite misogyny. Mm -hmm. um, everybody feels that way. It's true. It, yeah. and, and little girls, I don't know about little boys, but little girls uh, grow up looking at um, magazine covers and their celebrities that they know that have all been photoshopped to look uh, some idealized way of being beautiful. And and it just reinforces the notion that they're not enough, they're not pretty enough, you know. So <clears throat> we live in a society that, um, yeah, you're right, it's universal, this sense of not being right in our bodies. And, and when they see me, they see someone who is disfigured but feels confident and beautiful. Mm -hmm. And that is so fundamentally, deeply exciting to them. They don't necessarily know what's going on, but they are seeing that they too could feel that way. Mm -hmm. This is a hidden benefit of right. facial difference. Uh, we don't have those of us who look so radically different and disfigured, if you will. We don't have to deal with the other thing. Well, we do have to deal with it, but we're forced inside to find our inner beauty. And that's an advantage. Right. That's an advantage that all you cute people don't have. <laughs> so that's why you call it a gift. Yes, it is a gift, because mm -hmm. uh, I had to look inside myself to find who I am and my beauty. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's not like, okay, just like that. No, no. Man, of course it takes time, just like with everything else. Well, but and also, you, you, um, sorry, go ahead. I was saying you can build it. You can build that sense of yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't you feel, though, you had to climb a mountain of monsters in popular culture that are all made up of people who are either have physical differences or are um, they use makeup and um, prosthetics to make the person look like they have physical differences. Isn't that a mountain out there that you're climbing sort of psychologically to get you're, past it? You're talking about Hollywood. Well, yeah, I am. It's everywhere. Because I know. That little place of fear that you have inside yourself, mm -hmm. the powers that they want you to feel afraid because if you show a say you're going to die the next part. If you show a say you're going to get close. If you show a say you're going to work out. Or you're going to hide yourself. Or you're going to start drinking. Right. On and on. You're right. going to be. That, that's, that place inside you, if you don't deal with it, that's where the predators come to feed. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Sexual, financial, political, military. The bullies. On and on. Yeah. Because they want you to be afraid. Fear is a good thing in our society. Yeah. And, okay, Hollywood. I remember seeing the movie Wonder Woman a few years ago, and there's that Israeli actress who's like stunningly attractive, and then uh, she's fighting the evil. But the evil turns out to be a woman with a facial difference. What? Is that, that the woman that whose part of her face is gone and she wears a mask like Phantom yeah. of the Opera? Oh, okay, yes. 
And the whole movie is about women, powerful, yay. Okay, then women, evil. You yes, know. yeah. F, 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 F. On and on. There's just a million different movies. That, uh, and, and it's so lazy. And say, it is. Yeah, so when they someone, yeah, well, here, yeah, just give them a stop. Here, here's another one, The Lion King. Right. The evil person is named Ska. Yes. What kind of message is that to a child with plus talent? Or with any kind of Ska or yeah. any kind of difference? The evil is nicknamed Ska? I know. Yes, me, please. So, I'm ranting, I'm ranting now, sorry. As somebody who's been you know, more aware of this than perhaps I have been. Has there any ever been an evil person who's, you know, the most beautiful part of the cast and blonde hair and blue eyed and symmetrical face and all that jazz? Has, have they have they cast anybody like that as the evil monster? Well, they're trying to, but mainly they get jobs as politicians and CEOs. Mm. So they're not as evil about the Hollywood. Hmm. Yeah, I'm joking, of course. <laughs> Uh, you know, once in a while you'll have some plasticized person who will be evil, but very rarely. So they're not, they don't look normal, they don't look real as no, in their beautiful look. self as evil. Isn't that interesting? Huh? Yeah. So, so you talk about your shadow side being on the outside. And this is what you're talking about, that 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 um, that lots of us have our shadow self that we hide, the part of us that feels disfigured and wrong and ugly. And um, um, and so we're hiding that, projecting that we're beautiful. I do it all the time. I don't look in the mirror sometimes if I haven't put my makeup on so I can go outside <laughs> with this idea of what I look like. And because I can't see myself as I move through life. Yeah. Um, then, then I can hold on to that that idea of what I think I look like. There were times during COVID when um, you know you hadn't gone out of your house for a couple of weeks, and you hadn't yeah. changed your clothes in a couple of days, and you hadn't brushed your hair because you didn't have to, or put on makeup. And I'd catch myself in the mirror and go, "Oh my lord, must <laughs> I not go out?" But so what you're talking about is that's our sh shadow side, that's the part of us that doesn't feel beautiful whether or not it's physically or emotionally yeah yeah um i had a little kid ask me to ask you where is that question oh here it is a uh, cerebral palsy and yeah. um wanted to know what you would do if kids didn't want to hang out with you and i know you're much older than kids and stuff but what would you say to a kid like that Asked that question. The kids who don't want to hang out with you, there's no reason to hang out with them at all. Keep your eyes open for people who have your level of intelligence, your kind of heart. There are people like that. And when they tell you that you're great, you have to believe them and you take it in and you build slowly your own circle of support. Mm -hmm. But there are people, maybe, okay, you don't get to hang out with the really cute, sexy kids, but you can actually hang out with a lot better people than that. Yeah, and really. So okay, that circle of support, slowly build it, and believe it when people tell you that you're great. Yes. That is the hardest part sometimes for us yeah, fragile yeah. people with fragile egos. Um, definitely. And I still struggle with that, you know, wanting to be friends with somebody who I get off the phone with and I feel horrible every time and I keep wondering, why are you doing this? Stop doing this. So it is a hard lesson to learn. I'm hoping that kids are learning it much better, faster than than I am. So what is next for David? What happens well, now? We have a year-long project, Marlena and I, hmm. called The Power of Facial Difference. We're going to, uh, we uh, have helped start a stickers journal with the Children's Training and Facial Association. Uh, there are a couple of stickers in there, Lashira Dotson and Jasmine Gray, 
who we want to put forward as representatives of a new level of leadership. Mm -hmm. The power of facial difference is that we do know that we are good because we have had that gift of being pushed inside ourselves. Right. Not everybody, but a lot of us yes. have. And now there is a global community of people with facial differences formed on social media a lot. And we are trying to take steps to move forward with that, to encourage people to push, uh, we're pushing my, our film, we're pushing these speakers, uh, all kinds of things. And we're gonna have a world premiere in spring, probably in June and July, uh, from all over the world, where we're going to present the truth about facial difference, that we know things about the human condition that regular people, the able-faced, if you will. <laughs> I love that, the able-faced. Uh, don't know. Right. Uh, we have something to offer you, so listen up. Yes, yeah, that's wonderful. And is this a forum? that you're gonna be doing or a panel or a conference or what do you mean by premiere? Well, we'll show the film, we'll have speeches. Okay. Uh, I'm sure we'll have panels, we'll involve uh, organizations from other parts of the world uh, on panels. Uh, we're building at this point, we have half a year to build towards it and we'll see what it turns out to be. That's wonderful. Of oh, course, this is online. This is, um, uh, but it's called the power of facial difference yes okay it's, well we'll pay attention to that let us know when that's happening and come back on and chat with us about that so that we can let people know it's happening out there um you also have been doing the church of the 80 percent sincerity and have, are you still doing that or is that something that is I, I realized I want to start that again. I did that years ago. I started the Church of 80% Sincerity in a dance studio in San Francisco. It was nothing but storytelling and singing. And people loved it. And by the end of the summer, we had like 35 people every Sunday morning. I'm going to do that again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm just realizing that, partially as a result of what I heard from people after the Board of Canada um, Award. So uh, I'm, I'm excited about that. We'll see what happens with that. Mm -hmm. And I'm writing, and I'm writing, and I'm teaching uh, storytelling uh, yeah, with a critical kudos to people with uh, so called intellectual disabilities. I'm teaching storytelling at local high schools when I can, mm -hmm. when the door is open. Yes. And, uh, uh, yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah. I, I do lots of little things. You know, the pandemic has uh, cut it short a lot, but that's fine. And I, I'm comfortable online. Good. Uh, so we'll see what happens. I'm open. I, I, the, the whole thing of getting all this approval is like, yes, it's validated my past life, but it's also encouraged me, like, well, David, you're not done yet. No, you're no, you're not you done yet. yet. You can be a very good boy. No, you're not done until people stop saying things like, oh, how tragic it is. She died. She was so beautiful. Or she can't go to jail. She's too beautiful for jail. <laughs> or things like that. Until yeah. those things aren't being said, you're not done. Absolutely. So thank okay. you, David, so yeah. much for the work that you're doing. Thank and you very much. No, you're welcome. Thanks for coming and chatting with me. I'm Bernadine Fox, and that's our show. My thanks to David Roach, an extraordinary man who just was awarded the Order of Canada for his work around disability and facial difference. And as always, my thanks goes out to you for joining us today. Stay safe out there. 
I'm Bernadine Fox, and you've just listened to Rethreading Madness, the podcast that dares to change how we think about mental health. We air live on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM, every Tuesday at 5 p.m. or online at coopradio.org. If you have questions or feedback about this program or want to share your story or have something to say to us, we want to hear from you. You can reach us by email, rethreadingmadness at coopradio.org. If you enjoyed this show, subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Say to be nice, or somehow.